this is just one of my like morning smoke and chill spaces. So the books that I choose to read when I do one of those is more relaxed, more chill. I still do commentary, but, and don't get me wrong, it's still going to be from a radical liberation, black focused perspective, but it's a lot more chill. So the book I'm reading is Bell Hooks All About Love. I'm starting on chapter eight. I'm glad I'm revisiting this book because I read this book when I was really young, and with all the experiences that I have thus far, it's definitely given me a new perspective, different critiques, but again, also just challenging what and how I view love in a more radical sense. So I'm going to go ahead and start reading. So this is chapter eight, community, loving communion. Community cannot take root in a divided life. Long before community assumes external shape and form, it must be present as a seed in the undivided self. Only as we are in communion with other with ourselves can we find community with others. That's Parker Palmer quote. To ensure human survival, everywhere in the world, females and males organize themselves into communities. Communities sustain life, not nuclear families or the couple, and certainly not the rugged individualist. There is no better place to learn. Oh, real quick, let me go back to the space. So, lady, um, you and the listeners, can you hear me? If you could throw up like a thumbs up emoji. If not, I'll go ahead and like close. Oh, you can hear me good. Okay, thank you. I'll go ahead and go back to the book. I can't see the space. So when I read, I'm reading from the uh, book. So my bad, I just wanted to make sure. I'm gonna start over. To ensure human survival everywhere in the world, females and males organize themselves into communities. Communities sustain life, not nuclear families or the couple, in quotes, and certainly not the rugged individualist. There is no better place to learn the art of loving than in community. M. Scott Peck begins his book with the different drum, community making and peace with a profound declaration. In a thorough community lies the salvation of the world. Peck defines community as the coming together of a group of individuals who have learned how to communicate honestly with each other, whose relationships go deeper than their mask of composure, and who have developed some significant commitment to rejoice together, mourn together, and to delight in each other and make others' conditions our own. We are all born into the world of community. Rarely, if ever, does a child come into the world in isolation with only one or two onlookers. Children are born into a world surrounded by the possibility of communities. Family, doctors, nurses, midwives, and even admiring strangers compromise, oh, I'm sorry, comprise this field of connections, some more intimate than others. Much of the talk about family values, in quote, in our society highlights the nuclear family, one that is made up of mother, father, and preferably one or two children. In the United States, this unit is presented as the primary and preferable organization for the parenting of children, one that will ensure everyone's optimal well-being. Of course, this is a fantasy image of family. Hardly anyone in our society lives in an environment like this. Even individuals who are raised in nuclear families usually experience it as merely a small unit within a larger unit of extended kin. Capitalism and patriarchy together as structures of domination have worked over time to undermine and destroy this large unit of extended kin placing the family community with a more privatized, small, autocratic unit, helped increase alienation and made abuses of power more possible. It gave absolute rule to the father and secondary rule over children to the mother. By encouraging the segregation of nuclear families from the extended family, women were forced to become more dependent on an individual man and children more independent on an individual woman. It is this dependency that became and is the breeding ground for abuses of power. The failure of the patriarchal nuclear family has been utterly documented, exposed as a dysfunctional more often than not, as a place of emotional chaos, neglect, and abuse. Only those in denial continue to insist that this is a, the best environment for raising children. While I do not want to suggest that extended families are not as likely to be dysfunctional, simply by virtue of their size and their inclusion of non-blood kin, individuals who marry into the family and their blood relations, they are diverse, 
and so are likely to include the presence of some individuals who are both sane and loving. So real quick, I think what happens when people hear these things is that they think that, oh, she's talking about, you know, destroying the family. No, what she's talking about is that, especially with Black folks, our culture is actually to live, have more communal families. So the family structure isn't this isolated thing of, oh, only the couple and their children. In Black households and in people of African descent and Indigenous descent as well, oftentimes throughout history, we function best when it's more communal. So your extended family is very much important. It's not an afterthought. It's not something you tap into for colonial holidays and maybe Sunday get-togethers. No, it's actually a part of raising your kids. That the aunts, the uncles, the grandmothers, the great grandmothers and fathers, and all of your extended family cousins are all a part of this unit that we use to not only protect each other, but help in our human development. Since we've gotten away from that and become more isolated, we can see how we haven't grown as people and how, how much we are divided as a community, but then also too, our emotional intelligence has taken a great hit by going towards more of this capitalist, alienated form of a nuclear family. It's actually destructive. But in order to hear and critique that, we gotta be open to understand like what these words mean and when people critique it, where they're coming from. So I just wanted to say that. While I do not suggest extended families are, oh, I'm sorry. When I first began to speak publicly about my dysfunctional family, my mother was enraged. To her, my achievements were a sign that I could not have suffered that much in our nuclear family. Yet I know I survived and thrived despite the pain of childhood, precisely because there were loving individuals among our extended family who nurtured me and gave me a sense of hope and positivity. They showed that our family's interactions did not constitute a norm, that there were other ways to think and behave, different from the accepted patterns in our household. This story is common. Surviving and triumphing over dysfunctional nuclear families may depend on the presence of what psychoanalyst Alice Miller calls enlightened witnesses. Practically every adult who experienced unnecessary suffering in childhood has a story to tell about someone whose kindness, tenderness, and concern restored their sense of hope. This can only happen because family existed as part of a larger community. The privatized patriarchal nuclear family is still a fairly recent form of social organization in the world. Most world citizens do not have and will never have the material resources to live in small units segregated from the larger family communities. And that's so true. Like, yo, I remember being just po, po. We couldn't afford the OR, like they always say, just broke, bruh. But it wasn't unusual for me to go down the street to a lady we called Grandma Rose, who wasn't blood related, but she like raised all the neighborhood kids, all of us. And like I stayed with her for so long between the ages of one and 10. Like, and anyways, it wasn't unusual for me to go to her and go eat dinner with her and the kids that she was babysitting at the time, no matter if like my mom dropped me off or not. That was really important. Like if she didn't have that communal practice, if the people in the block weren't already practicing that and making that a normal thing. You know, imagine me just staying in the house, not eating because that wasn't something, going to my neighbor wasn't something that was practiced, but fortunately it was. It saved my life many times. Um, in the United States, studies show that economic factors, the high cost of housing, unemployment are swiftly creating a cultural climate in which grown children are leaving the family home later and are frequently returning or never leaving in the first place. Research by anthropologists and sociologists indicates that small privatized units, especially those organized around patriarchal thinking, are unhealthy environments for everyone. Globally enlightened, healthy parenting is the best realized within the context of community and extended family networks. The extended family is a good place to learn the power of community. However, it can only become a community if there is an honest communication between the individuals in it. Dysfunctional extended families like smaller nuclear family units are usually characterized by muddied communication. Keeping family secrets from often, keeping family secrets often makes it impossible for extended groups to build community. There was once an advertisement that used the slogan, the family that prays together stays together. Since prayer is one way to communicate, it no doubt does help family members stay connected. 
I remember hearing the slogan as a teenager, usually in situations where authority figures were coercing us to pray and changing it to the family that talks together stays together. Talking together is one way to make community. If we do not experience love in our extended families or of origin, which is the first site for community offered us, the other place where children in particular have the opportunity to build community and know love is in friendship. Since we choose our friends, many of us from childhood on into our adulthood have looked to friends for the care, respect, knowledge, and all around nurturance of our growth that we did not find in the family. Writing in her moving memoir, Never Let Me Down, Susan Miller recalls, I kept thinking love must be here somewhere. I looked and looked inside myself, but I couldn't find it. I knew what love was. It was the feeling I had for my dolls, for beautiful things, for certain friends. Later on, when I knew Debbie, my best friend, I felt even more sure that love was what made you feel good. Love was not what made you feel bad. Hate yourself. It was what comforted you, freed you up inside, made you laugh. Sometimes Debbie and I would fight, but that was different because we were basically essentially connected, end quote. Loving friendships provide us with the space to experience the joy of community in a relationship where we learn to process all our issues, to cope with differences and conflict while staying connected. Most of us raise to believe we will either find love in our first family, our family of origin, or if not there in the second family, we are expected to form through committed romantic couplings, particularly those that lead to marriage or lifelong bondings. Many of us learn as children that friendship should never be seen as just as important as family ties. However, friendship is the place which a great majority of us have our first glimpse of redemptive love and caring community. Learning to love and friendships empowers us in ways that enable us to bring this love to other interactions with family or with romantic bonds. A dear friend's mother died when she was just a young adult. Once when I was complaining about my mother fussing at me, she shared that she would give anything to hear her mother's voice scolding her. Encouraging me to be patient with my mother, she spoke of the pain of losing her mother and wished they had worked harder to find a place of communication and reconciliation. Her words reminded me to be compassionate, to focus on what I really enjoy about my mother. In friendships, we are able to hear honest, critical feedback. We trust that a true friend desires our good. My friend wants me to relish in the presence of my mother. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> the reason why I say that is because although she accurately describes like alienation caused by living in a white supremacist capitalist patriarchal system. My thing is, if we understand we live under those horrible conditions, we understand, too, that a lot of abuses take place. I'm not saying she's ignoring those because I'm pretty sure she covers it in this chapter. But so far. Like in saying that, I just want us to keep in mind that sometimes, too, an example of a great friend and to show how we love through those connections is understanding that, yo, my people, including me, lived in abusive households. So when we would vent to each other, when we talk to each other and look for that connection that we couldn't get at home, part of that connection was understanding not everyone's mom is fucking great or good or worthy of just ignoring harmful things. And we formed bonds that. My best friends from group home on, we're still friends to this day because we were able to like see each other and not tell each other like, oh, she's your mom, you know, show grace. No, there's no grace for abuse. So I just want to say that example. Her example can't be true in ways in which it's like, oh, my mom's annoying type way. But unfortunately, for well, my experience and most experience in communities I've been to, a lot of our households, not just with the mother, but father, uncles, cousins, all that shit is very abusive. So I think it's important to note that part of loving and creating connections is understanding that, understanding our material conditions, and then responding accordingly. A dear friend's mother, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Often we take friendships for granted, even when they are the interactions where we experience mutual pleasure. Mm, that's very true. We place them in a secondary position, especially in relations to romantic bonds. This devaluation of our friendships creates an emptiness we may not see when we are devoting all of our attention to finding someone to love romantically or giving all our attention to a chosen loved one. Committed love relationships are far more likely to become codependent when we cut off all our ties with friends to give these bonds we consider primary 
our exclusive attention. I have felt especially devastated when close friends who were single fell in love and simultaneously, sorry, simultaneously fell away from our friendship. When a best friend chose a mate who did not click with me at all, it caused me heartache. Not only did they begin to do everything together, the friends she stayed closest to were those he liked best. The strength of our friendship was revealed by our willingness to confront openly the shift in our ties and to make necessary changes. We do not see each other as much as we once did, and we no longer call each other daily, but the positive ties that bind us remain intact. The more genuine or romantic loves, the more we do not feel called upon to weaken our seven ties with friends in order to strengthen ties with the romantic partners. Trust is the heartbreak of genuine love. And we trust that the attention our partners give friends or vice versa does not take anything away from us. We are not diminished. What we learn through experience is that our capacity to establish deep and profound connections and friendship strengthens all of our intimate bonds. When we see love as the will to nurture one's own or another's spiritual growth, revealed through acts of care, respect, knowing, and assuming responsibility, the foundation of all love in our life is the same. There is no special love exclusively reserved for romantic partners. Genuine love is the foundation of our engagement with ourselves, with family, with friends, with partners, with everyone we choose to love. While we or why we will necessarily behave differently depending on the nature of a relationship or have varying degrees of commitment, the values that inform our behavior when rooted in a love ethic are always the same for any interaction. One of the longest romantic relationships of my life was when, oh, I'm sorry, was one in which I behaved in the more traditional manner of placing it above all other interactions. When it became destructive, I found it difficult to leave. I found myself accepting behavior, verbal and physical abuse that I would not have tolerated in a friendship. I had been raised conventionally to believe this relationship was special, in quotes, and should be revered above all. Most women and men born in the 50s or earlier were socialized to believe that marriages and or committed romantic bonds of any kind should take precedence over all other relationships. I have been evaluating my relationships from a standpoint that emphasized growth rather than duty and obligation. I would have understood that abuse irreparable undermines bonds. So basically she describes that because of our indoctrination that the most important thing is our marriage or romantic relationships, she pushed all her friends aside and alienated herself to this marriage. And so when it became abusive, she had nowhere else to go, but she had already abandoned the bond she had. So it left her alienated and more willing to compromise her own boundaries when it came to abuse, to where she was accepting verbal and physical abuse, where in other relationships, she was a sound mind and knew not to accept those things. So that's what she talks about. And why, again, the establishment of us approaching relationships in a more communal sense should be discussed more as like a healthy approach and a more sustainable approach than to what we have now. We have way too many people out here who are just lonely. Real talk. <laughs> lonely and touch starved. And it's really sad. And I think too, we're seeing the the side effects of that and how we see people gravitate more towards like violent and toxic forms of connecting, whether it be friend, platonic or romantic, and how draining that shit is. I would have understood the abuse repairable, repairably undermines bonds. All too often, women believe it is a sign of commitment, an expression of love to endure unkindness or cruelty, to forgive and forget. In actuality, when we love rightly, we know that the healthy, loving response to cruelty and abuse is putting ourselves out of harm's way. Even though I was committed feminist as a young woman, all that I knew and believed in politically about equality was, for a time, overshadowed by a religious and familiar, familial upbringing that had socialized me to believe everything must be done to save the relationship. In retrospect, I see how ignorance about the art of loving placed the relationship at risk from the start. 
in the more than 14 years we were together, we were too busy repeating old patterns learned in childhood, acting on misguided information about the nature of love, to appreciate the changes we needed to make in ourselves to be able to love someone else. Importantly, like many other women and men, irrespective of sexual preference, who are in relationship, where they are the objects of intimate terrorism, I would have been able to leave this relationship sooner or recover myself within it had I brought to this soon had I brought to this bond of the level of respect, care, knowledge, and responsibility I brought to my friendships. Women who would no more tolerate a friendship in which they were emotionally and physically abused stay in romantic relationships where these violations occur regularly. Had they brought to these bonds the same standards they bring to friendships, they would not accept victimization. Naturally, when I left this long-term relationship, which had taken so much time and energy, I was terribly alone and lonely. I learned then that it is more fulfilling to live one's life. You know, I like how she worded that, my bad. I was terribly alone and lonely. So would be like, oh, that's redundant, but not really because you can be surrounded by or have like a community full of friends and still feel like lonely. And at the same time, you could be alone and feel like fulfilled. Like, so I just like how she worded that. That's interesting. I learned then that it is more fulfilling to live one's life within a circle of love, interacting with loved ones to whom we are committed. Lots of us learn this lesson the hard way by finding ourselves alone and without meaningful connections to friends. And it has, and it has, and see the way she words it, sorry y'all, the way she words like alone, or I'm sorry, the way she phrases this sentence of like making sure she says, when she says alone, she backs it up with and void of meaningful connections. So like the problem isn't just being alone. Like you could be by yourself and be balanced and still have like fulfilling relationships, but still have a, a lifestyle that's kind of, you know, to yourself. Like being alone isn't the problem. It's being alone and not having connection to community. That's the issue. I learned that in more fulfilling to, I learned that, I learned then that it is more fulfilling to live one's life within a circle of love, interacting with loved ones to whom we are committed. Lots of us learn this lesson the hard way by finding ourselves alone and without meaningful connections to friends. And it has been the experience of both living in fear of abandonment in romantic relationships and being abandoned that has shown us that the principles of love are always the same in any meaningful bond. To love well is the task in all meaningful relationships, not just romantic bonds. I know the individuals who accept dishonesty in their primary relationships or who are themselves dishonest when they would never accept it in relationships. Satisfying friendships in which we share mutual love provides a guide for behavior in other relationships, including romantic ones. They provide us all with a way to know community. That's, that's been true for me. Like as you practice friendships and building those relationships through thick and thin, it does help you navigate other relationships more successfully because it's like a practice. Within a loving community, we sustain ties by being compassionate and forgiving. Eric Butterworth's Life is for Loving includes a chapter on love and forgiveness. Insightfully, he writes, we cannot endure without love and there is no other way to return. Oh, there's no other way to the return of healing, comforting, harmonizing, love than through total and complete forgiveness. If we want freedom and peace and the experience of love and being loved, we must let go and forgive. Forgiveness is an act of generosity. It requires that we place releasing someone else's from the prison of their guilt or anguish over our feelings of outrage or anger. By forgiving, we clear a path on the way to love. It is a gesture of respect. True forgiveness requires that we understand the negative actions of another. While forgiveness is essential to spiritual growth, it does not make everything immediately wonderful or fine. Often, New Age writing on the subject of love makes it seem as though everything will always be wonderful if we are just loving. Realistically, being part of a loving community does not mean we will not face conflicts, betrayals, negative outcomes from, from positive actions, or have things happening to good people, have bad things happening to good people. Love allows us to confront these negative realities in a manner that is life-affirming and life-enhancing. 
Yo, that's a good point. Because sometimes we read these things and we'll be like, oh, okay, so just forgive blindly and just love everybody and everything is copacetic. No, no, having boundaries is good. That's also an act of love and also part of forgiveness. Like forgiveness isn't just like blindly accepting abuses in any way, shape or form. Forgiving is like, okay, I see what has happened in this situation. I see in the ways it's harmed me and I'm setting this boundary, but at the same time, since we're talking and working through it, I can forgive you if you respect these boundaries, but then also understand the ways in which you harm me and are willing to do what needs to be done to like fix that. Like forgiveness is a process. It's not on the onus of the victim or the victimized. Like it's not just one a one-way street, I believe. So there's healthy ways of doing that. And when we understand that, that's more complex than we understand that like love is not saying like, oh, bad things will never happen if everyone's just in this permanent state of love. <laughs> No, no, love is like, to me, love is like having the tools that equips you to be able to deal with all of life complex ups and downs with the people around you in a way that that's healthy and still spiritually fulfilling. So, yeah. So it helps you not to be so afraid when conflict comes, to be able to not avoid it, but confront it, build from it, and then able to grow. And if you do that together with people, you just accomplished a, like a communal evolution, basically, especially if it's continuously practiced. Let's see where I left off. When a, co when a colleague whose work I admired, whom I considered a friend, who for no reason that was ever clear to me began to write vicious attacks of my work, I was stunned. Her critiques were full of lies and exaggerations. I have been a caring friend. Her actions hurt. To heal this pain, I entered into an empathic identification with her so that I could understand what might have motivated her. In forgiveness, a bold choice for a peaceful heart, Robert explains forgiveness is a way of life that gradually transforms us from being helpless victims of our circumstances to being powerful and loving co-creators of our reality. It is the fading away of perceptions that cloud our ability to love. Through the practice of compassion and forgiveness, I was able to sustain my appreciation for her work and cope with the grief and disappointment I felt about the loss of this relationship. And that's important. She says that basically she ended that friendship rightfully, right? But I think sometimes we hear forgiveness, we think like, oh, we still have to be connected to this person. No, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. It can often, it's just a process, but also it can end like relationships. It's okay to say this relationship is no longer fulfilling. It no longer affirms me or lifts me, so I'm going to end it. That's good, actually, because that person acting in the way that they're acting, that's toxic. And that process of forgiveness of bringing up the problem and, and the ways in which they harmed you, it gives them also the opportunity to self-reflect. And hopefully do the internal work to be a better person so that the people that they're in community with, they can engage with them in a more positive, affirming, loving way. Practicing compassion enabled me to understand why she might have acted as she did and to forgive her. Forgiving means that I am able to see her as a member of my community still, one who has a place in my heart, should she wish to claim it. We all long for loving community. It enhances life's joy. But many of us seek community solely to escape the fear of being alone. Knowing how to be solitary is central to the art of loving. When we can be alone, we can be with ourselves without using them as a means of escape. Throughout his life, the theologian Henry Nguyen emphasized the value of solitude. In many of his books and essays, he discouraged us from seeing solitude as being about the need for privacy, sharing his sense in that, in solitude, we find the place where we can truly look at ourselves and shed the self, the false self. In his book, Reaching Out, he stresses that loneliness is one of the most universal sources of human suffering today. There's like a difference between lonely and uh, alone. Yo, just for the recording, because I can't see the space, but for the recording, there was this video on, I believe it was TikTok. And it was a woman being incredibly vulnerable. She was talking about how she's touched art, how like she's never felt like a romantic touch. 
experience like holding hands with a partner down the street. Like never, never been kissed. No form of intimacy from someone else in romantic sex ever in her life. And I think she was in her 30s, if I remember right. And she was so heartbroken and sad. And the responses to the video were a lot of people in her age range. Well, you know what? Actually, it varied. It was all across the board, regardless of age, who are experiencing the same thing. And I thought about like how COVID, you know, the living through a pandemic, but even before that, how incredibly isolated and alienated we were from each other and how we have a whole groups of people all across the world, well, all across the United States to be specific, who are very much like touched off and alone and lacking of experiences with different people in different situations that can be romantic and fulfilling. And damn, I just thought how sad that fucking is and how heartbreaking that is. Because I mean, shit, if it wasn't for the ways in which I connected with people romantically, it helps to form like the ways in which I view the world. Love is very important. Connection is extremely important. It's part of it's part of like being human, but also part of being a spiritual being. And the fact that a lot of us aren't getting that regularly or help in a healthy manner. Shit. Think how empty we're just all walking around, basically like emotionally the walking dead, if you think about it. Let's see. No one contends that no friend or lover, no husband or wife, no community or commune will be able to put to rest our deepest cravings for unity and wholeness. Wisely, he suggests we put those feelings to rest by embracing our solitude, by allowing divine spirit to reveal itself there. The first road is the road of conversion, the conversion from loneliness into solitude. Instead of running away from our loneliness and trying to forget or deny it, we have to protect it and turn it into fruitful solitude. Loneliness is painful. Solitude is peaceful. Loneliness makes us cling to others in desperation. Solitude allows us to respect others and their uniqueness and create community. When children are taught to enjoy quiet time, to be alone with their thoughts and reveries, they carry the skill into adulthood. Individuals young and old striving to overcome fears of being alone often choose meditation practice as a way to embrace solitude. Learning how to sit in stillness and quietude can be the first step towards knowing comfort and aloneness. Moving from solitude into community heightens our capacity for fellowship with, our, with one another. Through fellowship, we learn how to serve one another. I think it, I just want to stop right quick for the recording because we do need to start thinking about or talking about ways in which we can navigate this world we find ourselves where we are alienated. So I just don't want people to get confused. Like, Messages like this get co-opted and repackaged to justify the way in which a white supremacist capitalist state has us in. Basically say, oh, see, your loneliness isn't bad. If you just be happy in it, you're good. And in the toxic presentation of that, that could say that, oh, there's really no need for a community as long as you're happy within yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like it can create a rhetoric of supporting when co-opted can support a individualistic, individual, indi sorry, I'm struggling with the word individualistic propaganda to saying being by yourself is okay. That's not what she's describing. Yes, she's saying being by yourself is okay, but in the context of navigating how to form community in the meantime. So basically, since we find ourselves in an alienated state, the majority of us, even after us, will be born in an alienated state since we haven't destroyed white supremacy and capitalism, right? So then we would have to be equipped to know how to navigate that, but not navigate that for that to be a permanent state, but to navigate in a way in which we'll be still spiritually fulfilled and emotionally intelligent while we create community. So we have to always be actively working to create community. And that strategy is literally a sustainable way to not only live a fulfilling life, but it is also necessary in our liberation. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Moving from solitude into community heightens our capacity for fellowship with one another. Through fellowship, we learn how to serve one another. Service is another dimension of communal love. 
At the end of her autobiography, The Will of Life, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross confesses, I can assure you that the greatest rewards in our whole life will come from opening our heart to those in need. The greatest blessings always come from helping. And I would say the greatest love that I'll experience in my lifetime is doing any and everything I can to destroy the system that creates these conditions. So I just want to say that. Like being in service to those in need, yes, do that, but that's temporary. That's to, that's, that's to do in the moment. But we should always always be working towards destroying the system that creates a people in need. Like that incentivized keeping of people constantly in need. We, that shouldn't be something we should, we shouldn't build like a practice of just maintaining that. No, it should, all, it should be destroyed and we should work to destroy it. While working to destroy it though, we need to also still be in service to each other until we create that reality in which we no longer live under systems of oppression that make it profitable to be exploited and therefore kept in perpetual neediness. Uh, the greatest blessings always come from helping. Women have been and are the world's greatest teachers about the meaning of service. We publicly honor the memory of exceptional individuals like Mother Teresa Ill, who have made a vocation of service, but there are women everyone knows whose identities the world will never publicly recognize, who serve with patience, grace, and love. All of us can learn from the example of these caring women. Earlier, I was describing my impatience with my mother. Looking at her life, I was awed by her service to others. She taught me and all her children about the value and meaning of service. As a child, I witnessed her patient care of the sick and dying. Without complaint, she gave shelter, to, shelter and aid to them. From her actions, I learned the value of giving freely. Remembering these actions is important. It is so easy for all of us to forget the service women give to others in everyday life, the sacrifices women make. Often, sexist thinking obscures the fact that these women make a choice to serve, that they give from the space of free will and not because of biological destiny. These are, these are plenty of folks who are not interested in serving, who despair of service. When anyone thinks a woman who serves gives because that's what mothers or real women do, in quotes, they deny full humanity and thus fail to see the generosity inherent in her acts. There are lots of women who are not interested in service, who even look down on them. The willingness to sacrifice is a necessary dimension of loving practice and living in community. None of us can have things our way all the time. Giving up something is one way we sustain a commitment to the collective well-being. Our willingness to make sacrifices reflects our awareness of interdependency. Hold on, real quick. Okay. Right. Writing about the need to bridge the gulf between rich and poor, Martin Luther King Jr. preached, all men and women are caught in an inescapable network of mutual mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This gulf is a bridge by the sharing of resources. Every day, individuals who are not rich, but who are materially privileged, make the choice to share with others. Some of us share through conscious tithing, regularly giving a portion of one's income, and others through a daily practice of loving kindness, giving to those in need when we randomly encounter. Mutually giving strengthens community. Enjoying the benefits of living and loving a community empowers us to meet strangers without fear and extended to them the gift of openness and recognition. Just by speaking to a stranger, acknowledging their presence on the planet, we make a connection. Every day, we all have the, an opportunity to practice the lessons learned in community. Being kind and courteous connects us to one another. In Peck's book, The Different Drum, he reminds us the goal of genuine community is to seek ways in which to live with ourselves and others in peace and love. Unlike other movements for social change that require joining organizations and attending meetings, we can begin the process of making community wherever we are. We can, we can begin by sharing a smile, a warm greeting, a bit of conversation, by doing a kind of deed, by doing kind deed or acknowledging kindness offered us. Daily, we can work to bring our families into a greater community with one another. My brother was pleased when I suggested he think about moving to the same city where I live so that we could each see each other more, and enhanced in his feeling of belonging. 
It made me feel loved that he wanted to be where I was. Whenever I hear friends talk about estrangement from family members, I encourage them to seek a path of healing, to seek the restoration of bonds. At one point, my sister, who was a lesbian, felt that she wanted to break away from the family because family members were often homophobic. Affirming and sharing her rage and disappointment, I also encouraged her to find ways to stay connected. Over time, she has been made positive changes. She has seen fear give way to understanding, which would not have happened had she accepted estrangement as the only response to the pain of rejection. Whenever we heal family wounds, we strengthen community. Doing this, we engage in loving practice. That love lays the foundation for the constructive building of community with strangers. The love we make in community stays with us wherever we go. With this knowledge as our guide, we make any place we go a place where we return to love. After reading that chapter, it makes me want to like see a modern day version of this. Like someone needs to pick up the baton on this work and make it more modern to where we are today. Like what would radical look like? Love with like hair. Oh, yo, my bad. Let me. All right. I think you got a mic now. But that was the end of that chapter. I just wanted to make a quick space. Yo, what's up, Cheers? That was so good. Like, you really did that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was really good. That was a really good chapter. And I think you're right. Like, I would love to see someone follow up with it and also correct it. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, there was a lot there. I would say I feel Mm -hmm. for her sister. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't agree with that part about, oh, yeah, she did acknowledge, like, yeah, I acknowledged her rage, yeah. but then encouraged her to stay with the toxic people. There, <laughs> That does not work and is not sustainable. I would never encourage someone to put that aside. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to send good vibrations your way because that was pretty good. And I, I like positive energy and things like that. So, yeah, I enjoyed that too myself. Oh, appreciate you. Thank you. So, yeah, the morning, like, when I have these spaces and it says, like, smoke and meditate, that's when I read this kind of work, more self-reflective, more, I guess I'm just trying to explore, like, what does can a radical love look like? So I'm revisiting some works that I read in my younger years and then also just have, like, commentary and discussion about it or just let it be. But, yeah, so um, that is the end of that chapter. I'll probably do another one tomorrow morning. Or you know what? I'm going to just go with what I feel. If I feel like I want to read another chapter, I'll probably just open up the space and read one. So it might not be as consistent, but I'll try to make it so. Hold on, let me. There's another speaker. Hey, lady, what's good? Hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, having this space. I actually uh, have to shout out Choose because I uh, was asking her about uh, works to kind of introduce myself to bell hooks. Um, And to be honest, it was uh, predicated on a conversation that I see having on this app that stems from this gender war. And uh, I say that there was a PhD that uh, was uh, espousing negativity uh, towards uh, bell hooks. And I was honestly intrigued. I never read her work. So I wanted to see if there was any validity to what he was saying, because to be honest, I don't, just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you know everything. So um, yeah, I read it and I read, um, I actually started off with this book all about love. And then because of that conversation, I saw that she had a book on feminism and it's kind of like a little handbook. Uh, It's very accessible. I bought that book. I read it. I have so many highlights and I was just like, that guy was literally spouting lies (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I feel like everything that I've been exposed to when it comes to feminism, I don't have um, an academic background in this particular work. So um, it was very eye opening because I feel like we have been collectively lied to. And I think that we need to um, explore uh, these people's work who have made it kind of like, you know, their life's work to kind of explore these ideas Um, I have more of a kind of science tech background. So this is all new to me. 
but I'm just absorbing it because it's actually helping me in the way that I evaluate even my romantic and friend and uh, friendship and my friendships, right? Um, it's, it's actually challenging my thought process and how to look at having more meaningful relationships, right? Um, so I, I definitely got a lot out of this. So I appreciate the reading. My question though is I was trying to find um, all of the recordings. I found the chapter one, I found six and seven, and then of course this one, but are there, where's the other chapters? Oh, so <laughs> that's what I mean. I'd be just going off vibes. I did not start a chapter one on this mm -hmm. book. I was just picking out, actually me and Chu started reading together and I started reading, I started doing the spaces where we left off. So that's why I think it starts at chapter five. I think six and seven is on one. And then this is eight. Okay. And, but you know what? I don't mind going back and making a space for chapters one through five. And that way it's a complete work of this book. So I'll do that. No problem. Thank you. I really appreciate it because I actually was sharing this with someone who I've been <laughs> raving about this book. And I know that person does tend to be a bit busy and may not have time. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, they're not a reader. So I just wanted to share the series with them because it's a lot easier to work and listen um, to someone else reading to you. So um, thank you so much uh, for uh, doing that. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I'm not sure when I'll have time. I think this weekend is pretty good, but I can probably knock out a few chapters. I don't want to make any promises. I can't keep, but definitely. And what I'll do is I'll send it to you in a, like a DM when they're complete. Like just in case you can't make the space. And I I also have a thread. So I'll make sure to include it in that thread and send that to you too. So you can share with your friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then I have one more um request. Okay. Okay. I'm not a scholar in these areas. Okay. So reading some of these books, um, this is very accessible, but I'm gonna be honest. I started reading one of my late father's books, <laughs> which is um how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I think I'm a pretty intelligent person, but I'm like having to take my time to read and absorb because it's a lot. Mm -hmm. Like the concepts that he's touching on is actually touching on other concepts that I'm not familiar with. So if at all possible, um, if you guys are familiar with that book, um, if there could be like a reading on that, maybe and a breakdown, that would be really, really great. I got um, you. Let me add that to the list. So right now we're doing, there's a comrade Z who requested scenes of subjection by Sadia uh, Hartman that mm -hmm. we're still working on. That's going to be tomorrow. So after, and then I also added another book, The New Authoritarians, The Convergence of the Right. Mm -hmm. So after those two books, I'll do um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And we'll start that one. And we'll take our time with that one. Because like you said, there are a lot of difficult concepts. So how we'll break it down is like read for an hour and then have like, you. I don't know if you heard the other spaces, but commentary throughout, but then we'll also have a discussion. So we'll definitely take our time with it where we can build and get as much from it as possible. For sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really oh, it's all good. It. No, it's all good. So if there's, I don't know if y'all, there's any other speakers, but if not, that would be the end of that chapter. And I'll pick up maybe later tonight. I'm not sure. And try to fit in like two chapters. What's up, choose? No, so I just wanted to say, lady, I love how you brought up, <laughs> I don't know what PhD you're talking about, but I feel like I was in a room with Terrain Walker, and they was talking shit about bell hooks, and I was like, I'm so glad you brought up that they be lying. They I think that is the room, unless he's had another one since, but Terrain was the one that was hosting the room. And yeah. I don't have a problem with this guy, but he definitely has a chip on his shoulder when it comes <laughs> to black women. And I don't necessarily understand where it's coming from. But my primary problem with him is this. Just because you have a platform and a voice to voice your grievances, I would prefer if you voice your grievances based in fact, because that room, like I literally was angered enough that I was like, okay, before I you know, formulate this opinion. Let me read the work because I wasn't familiar with, and I'm so sorry, Truce, because I totally interrupted you, but this literally is what sparked this for me. Is like the lies. No, I'm, I'm just glad you voiced that, like I was saying, because 
Yeah, like they just dead as be lying. And then they, they're they lying to radicalize people. They're lying to radicalize people against feminism and against the study of patriarchy because they are complicit in it. They're complicit in it and they want to erase it so they don't have to be accountable for it. And that's why it's crazy when you hear them talk about it online because even as we're reading Bell Hooks, we're like, bitch, you love these niggas too much because we're even talking about it. Like, yo, like if someone is homophobic to you and is like abusive towards you, how are you going to go from love is not abuse, but connect with niggas who are abusing you? Like, that's not. So even I feel like Bell Hooks holds too much space for these niggas. And to hear them slander her is like, baby, like. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I totally get it. And that, like, in reading, like, um, feminism is for everyone. Because to be honest with you, the tenets of that book is actually in All About Love. So it didn't feel like I was segueing away, but I felt like reading them concurrently helped me to have a better understanding of these concepts, right? So in reading that, she does give Black men a lot of grace, and she, or men in general, but it's, I just speak more to black because that's our experience and that's her experience, I would think. But it's crazy because everything they say about how, you know, feminism is towards black men is literally antithetical to what feminism actually is and how she has actually given, she's like black men need to have, or men, I like to say black men, just know I'm saying black men because we're all black, right? And the, I guess I, for me, what sparked it for me is these this negative uh, talk around feminism and bell hooks by black men, not realizing that she actually see, supports you and wants to hold space for you to be able to fully embrace and express yourself without the chains of patriarchy. So it's really um, interesting the way that she kind of breaks things down. Even the way that she shows the dichotomy between like uh, like an adult man and woman versus like a adult woman to child or adult man to child, and what we're really what we see as absolutely unacceptable through the paradigm of an adult and a child, but we're willing to absolutely accept it if it's between two adults. And when you think about it in those terms, it's really fucked up. And I'm gonna be honest with you. I really haven't sat down to think about it in those terms. So this has really kind of opened up my mind. Anyway, I'll stop talking because I can talk forever. No, you you and Shoes hit a lot of important points. And to talk about, I wasn't in that space y'all referring to, but dealing with people who intentionally <laughs> mislead people and lie and spread that kind of propaganda, look how much work we miss that we need to talk about, the discussions we don't have. Like we have, just reading her work and I'll stop and do commentary because I can think of a million people who can be like affected by it when she talks about alienation and being alone and then how many people suffer from that. And then look how they go out in spaces and because they haven't practiced forming connections, they are very incredibly toxic and they've only practiced in that toxicity and it becomes natural for them. And then we don't have a way of challenging it because the work that people have done to analyze it has already been discredited. And again, they know they spread this misinformation, they do it and then it, especially the ones that have PhDs that do it, they know coming from them carries more weight. A per more people are less likely to go and actually look at the work like you did, lady, and go, hey, let me go evaluate this. Instead, so here's someone who says it with confidence, conviction, mm -hmm. and then look no further and say, I don't, I'm not even going to read her work. And so like, that's what, another reason why I created this space is about Bell Hooks too. Knowing that a lot of people will be turned off just by the name Bell Hooks appearing, I don't care. There's so much work that's missing, but not just reviewing her work, but seeing the shortcomings in which we should have already picked up the ton and expanded upon it so it can work for us today. So now I feel well. Um, I think a lot of things are motivated by past trauma and failure of relationships, honestly. I think a lot of the rhetoric that's going on now is just pretty much people projecting how they feel on the failures of their relationships in their past so they maximize by manipulating and deceiving people by using talking points that they know are, uh, that can cause shock value it's called mental gymnastics um, 
I'm not against feminism. I'm not against anything that empowers women because I have daughters. So I'm not going to stand for anything that will go against their, them being able to prevail. I just think that a lot of guys that are on these, like, these spaces and stuff like that, a lot of them are like, they're miserable. They're very miserable. And they can't, how can I say it? More women are now, you know, privy to the talk game and, you know, all the lies and stuff. You can't really sell women dreams anymore. So a lot of guys are frustrated behind that, you know? So it's causing them to go to radical women, to, you know, to, be, to, to, to disparage you, you know? Pretty much devalue what you say, make you look like you don't know what you're talking about, you know? So that's just my little two cents. No, yeah. And putting that into, like, the context of that happening under a system of like white supremacy and capitalism, what happens is, is that they end up siding with the state when they engage in those things. That's just how this results in. And that's why it's so important that we talk about this is because it's not just so, I mean, yes, the fail you failed or the, even thinking about seeing a relationship in as a failure is a very toxic trait, which then again, you start engaging in things in ways that are counter revolutionary to the community. And again, why we have to study these things, everything that happens, any way in which we interact has an immediate effect against, not against, but to all of us, even indirectly. That quote that she talked about Martin Luther King Jr., that us not being able to connect, that has reverberating effects and we see it. What's up, Shoes? You know, this is so good because I'm just, I just want to add like, yo, what function does it have for us to not study patriarchy? Because if we can identify, you know, that a lot of people are acting on past trauma, it's informing their political decisions. And like, we can name this and quantify it. Like, it does not serve us to not talk about those things. And the people who are trying to like forcibly repress these voices and like say, you know, bell hooks hates niggas and literally spread this information about her like it be niggas on here they'll like post the bell hooks quotes totally out of context and be like oh she said she supports the central park five in being called rapist and you look at the quote and people don't look back and say what was the context and what she was saying she was not saying she supported those boys as rapists but there are people on this app going around and saying that that's what she said and it's just like this is some real sick shit because we know what to what end this is for. Like this is for niggas to be fucking fascist. Um, this red pill shit, the manosphere shit is really just kind of the reactionary like response to women's empowerment, which is crazy. And they rather make feminism about like what women are saying rather than attacking a system, which is why black male studies just comes off as like these, like they, you hear them, they're like, we're talking about data. We're talking about data. He, they're basically saying you bitches are emotional. Like they're literally saying that there's no place for how we treat one another and our relationships in the study of how we relate. To, like, I don't understand. Yo, and that's Talk funny to bring up the emotional part, Shoes, because to me, it's an emotional response that because you had a failed relationship, you're not going to log into Twitter.com and go on a space and lie about a work that could actually set you free. Like, that's an emotional reactionary response. So to me, they're not working in logic. I think because they say, oh, you have a deep monotone, therefore it must be logical, a.k.a. truth. And it's like, no, motherfuckers, I could tell you a lie and not change my tone. It's still a fucking lie. Can I be honest with you? Mm -hmm. I think it's control. It's all control based. Once once people see that they can't control you anymore, they lose they lose their minds. That's really what it is. That's such a good point. Men can't control women like the way it was back in our old days. So now that they lost the power, they're sitting there scrambling, running around like with their heads cut off. They don't really understand what this is that's happening. It's called liberation. A lot of women are sexually liberated financially liberated and niggas is upset they mad because now they know that they can get they, a woman could just walk the fuck away whenever they want to and they don't like that yeah especially in a system that is constantly tying in the noose on 
the oppressed people's neck, right? Unfortunately, uh, instead of trying to kill the person who has that noose on our neck, you know, revolution and liberation, instead we try to find ways in which we can retain some kind of privilege and power within our margins. And it's detrimental, it's counter-revolutionary. So then when you see like someone in your eyes getting liberated, you're like, oh, wait, I can't oppress you anymore, where it will be sat satisfactory and incentive. And then, of course, we also can talk about, which is why I want to read that book on fascism, that as the rise of fascism comes, you know, you'll have people who will audition for a, posi a position in that, even though it won't be a high one. They'll be like, look, if you if you allow me to be an overseer in my community, where I maintain marginalized communities to oppress. I'm okay with that, even if that means I'll still be oppressed and living under fascism. And that's what we're seeing. We're actually seeing people literally say, ooh, ooh, massa, pick me. I'll be misogynist. I'll, I'll practice misogynoir. I'll be transphobic and homophobic. I'll do it. And even though it will not get you free. And I think we're seeing that publicly. Yeah, it's deception in its rarest forms. Absolutely. Uh, what's up, Kenz? It's beautiful. Uh, you just got a mic. Did you want to contribute? Oh, and then choose. You had your hand up after they, after she goes. Is trans is beautiful talking? Oh, um, hello. Um, hi guys. Um, can you hear me? I just yeah. want to make sure. Yes, hear you. Loud and okay. Clear. I just want to first say thank you for um inviting me like onto this onto the um thing the and letting me talk um. And um, hi to everybody, but um, I just want to say, um, as you guys were talking, it, it just made me think about certain things when you were talking about um, oppression of women's rights and everything. And it just made me think, uh, like, what do you call it? Because um, or originally, like, I'm African, so I've, like, experienced different cultures and everything like that. And I'm fully aware of how... Um, women are severely oppressed in um, a lot of these communities, um, especially rural communities, um, both in Africa and um, Asia and um, a lot of um, Arab countries as well. So what I've actually seen, and to me it does not, and, and, I, and I've actually seen that a lot of women um, here in America can actually just see through it. And um, But have you ever heard of the movement of... Um, like passport bros and all that stuff where they will um uh, yeah sex tourism literally um yes um basically and um I was actually talking to my um my um psychologist um yesterday about certain things where um just me as an African I don't for me I don't take it as a compliment and in fact um I see it as a huge red flag when any man comes to me and says um oh, you know, I don't really like um, American women. I, I, prefer, um, I prefer African women or Caribbean women or Asian women or something. These American women, so, so, so I'm just like, that's a red flag to me and walk away. And um, because to me, I don't, I don't see it as a compliment or anything like that. I see it more as um, you see, you feel the need to um, down your own kind of women, first of all, to seek some kind of approval or brownie points for, from me or something. And then also I see it as um, you instead want to find a woman who, um, especially if you go to a third world country, and I, and I just listen to conversations, okay, if you go to, they say stuff like, hey, brother, if you, if you go to Africa, you, you go to, um, go to, um, go to Asia, um, just don't, just don't bring bring your wife back back here or to, or to or to Canada or something because for me I see that as more so a control. They say oh she might get corrupted by um by American women or or Canadian women or something. I don't see it. and then they say oh it, it, she'll she'll be corrupted. No, it's not about she'll be corrupted. It's more so she'll she'll find more resources to empower her or something like that, and you'll have um let's control over her basically because um, in a lot of these countries like um there's lots of gender based violence and there's a lot of um like just so much um rape that happens and um the governments don't care and some of them are really complicit in the rape themselves and um i'm sure if you guys remember a couple of weeks ago i mean a week ago i think a couple of years ago there was a situation where an ambassador had to be deported from um America because he he had been physically assaulting his wife or something like that and 
in back in Africa or something, um, it would have been acceptable. It would have just been like, hey, there's nothing we're going to do about that. And sometimes women get stoned even and nobody cares. So, yeah, and I just want to say that. And, um, yeah, um, it's women's oppression. And, um, yeah, I just want to say that. And, um, yeah, thank you. And yeah. No, thank you for adding that because the exploitative nature of, you know, sex tourism, people coming from Western countries where capital has been stolen from the global South, then take advantage of the destabilization of the military industrial complex from the West and where they go to these communities where like, okay, the American dollar goes further. I can buy people, purchase them for my own, you know, sexual uses and vices. And no, I don't want them to be able to go in places where they might have access to resources and then autonomy. No, I want to take advantage of that and the restrictive and oppressive nature. And they proudly talk about that. And that's passport pros and how that is even accepted and not people be, I mean, there are people disgusted by it, but not enough, but to where they can create whole communities of this practice out loud. And it's not just passport pros too. Like we know these old asshole face here in the West engage in sex tourism all the time. They'll go to war-torn countries. Their countries, their places that their Western countries have destabilized will then go there with their money that goes further and take advantage of the desperation of people who don't want to be impoverished and that who don't have access to jobs or their own resources or don't have any autonomy whatsoever. So now they're at the helms of the people of the West who go there for sex tourism. It is disgusting. I'm so glad you brought that up. Because it does connect in the way in which we practice community and how we see people as objects, things that can be purchased. And then oftentimes because of not, and we have a whole system of propaganda encouraging it and living under capitalism, these ways of viewing each other as objects is also incentivized. And then living under white supremacy, black people are looked at as just chattel to be purchased and used and exploited sexually in every way exploited. So now I'm glad you brought that up and you made amazing points. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dia. Oh, my bad, bro. I can't read. It says, uh, I can't read. <laughs> it says, what does it say? Father? I can't see the whole name. Godfather. There we go. Thank you. Huh. Well, me, my opinion, how I look at it, I'm going back to what uh, the other girl was saying. Um, a lot of people lose respect for Americans, definitely black American men. They lose a lot of respect for them when they hear them say those things about their own women. People, they look at it like, if you, could, if, if you don't appreciate your own race of women, I know you'll never appreciate me. Like some women with a certain type of intellect, certain high levels of intellect, they'll look at it like that. Like, you talk about your own race of women like that? You, get it? you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, I think true. Erica Mina and them touched on that. Remember how they'll say, like, yeah, I date black men because they hate their own women. They take advantage of that, especially men that black men who, huh? That was what was said? Yeah, real talk. Cardi B literally said the reason why she dates black men is because they don't, the black men she's dated, they don't date black women. And they know that, and they, that's why they have access to me, especially black men who have resources. They're like, I already know how to do this. I know what they don't like. So they take advantage of that internalized anti-blackness so that they can get up socially. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's talked about a lot. Like, like you said, there are, people can uh, understand the material conditions and not just mm -hmm. that directly in, or in front of them, but they can see in other oppressed communities how that works. So when we publicly practice this anti-blackness, this, this ready to discard black women and practice colorism, those who benefit from that will take advantage because we live in a system that deprives us to get access to certain things unless we engage in these toxic things. Again, making it an incentive to engage in not only anti-blackness, but exploitation. Um, Commander, you were next. And then Lady... Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. I think I'm catching the gist of what is going on. Um, I heard uh, as far as not dating our own. Am I correct on that too? Not dating our own. So the space, I think you're asking about like the topic. Yeah. We were reading Bell Hooks, this chapter about community and love, and it kind of segued into like different ways in which we find that this work could help us. So then we got 
right now we landed like on sex tourism and then the anti-blackness and uh black men engaging in what's called uh shit what's it called uh trans is beautiful you just said it it was passport bros that's what it was we ended up on passport okay bros. now passport bros let me ask a question um passport bros would you what would you say the the race of most of them are are they black americans are they are they caucasians uh you know what i'm saying passport bros so to me the reason why you'll hear us say talk about black men who engage in it because we can see the direct impact that happens that affects our black community so that's not so us bringing up black men engaging in sex tourism mm -hmm. and human trafficking is not saying they're the only ones who do it so to answer your question is that all people or all people they're all races of people and genders who engage in sex tourism we're currently talking about black men right now. Okay, let's let's talk about what I what I heard the the guy before me say. But do you know that even back in the day with the athletes, you know, they go they get their money and they get them a white woman. So that's been going on forever. Uh you say uh the colorism. Are we talking how they will pick the light skin over the dark skin? So as far as saying like been happening, did I know? Yes, I think all of us in this room are pretty intelligent. We're talking about the current Christ, current way in which it manifests because we live in the present. So that's why we're talking about it now. And then to follow up about the athletes and colorism, we all understand living, living under white supremacy. It's not enough to just gain capital. You want social capital, you want prestige, you want privilege. That proximity to whiteness gets you that. Mm -hmm. So they understand and know and navigate the world in that way. Mm -hmm. We all do. In which we understand if we get a white partner, that means something as a status symbol in a system of white supremacy. So yes, that's what they're practicing with that. And they know full and well. You hear people all the time talking about how they want kids with good hair. Yeah. They want kids with green eyes. They want light skin kids. Kids that they are sexually attracted to. We, we don't wake that shit up too, but I don't want to take this space too far. But yes, examining these things and this works of bell hooks leads us to examining these things and how they not only are counter-revolutionary and how they're destroying the community, but then also to how our lack of bond and connections makes this makes that fertile ground for these things okay, to happen. Okay. But real quick, Commander, um, I'm gonna let you land your plane, and then we'll go to okay, Lady. Okay, now for the colorism, because you said white, but we will we say the colorism when it comes to, I guess, the so-called light-skinned woman is more of a trophy status type. Can we say that? Absolutely, because her light-skinnedness, yes, right, yes. Is, is due to proximity to whiteness. Okay, so that's, absolutely. That's what I was looking for. Also, I wanted to thank you guys for letting me comment on your uh, tweet the other day. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, about black love? Are you appreciating black yes. love? What's good? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you be easy. Go ahead, lady. And then pimp. Okay. I just wanted to read a quote uh, that I have because this, I'm being honest, I have so many bookmarks in this book. It has literally changed me, but um, I will read it. So it's in the next chapter. So I hope that's not um, too much foreshadowing oh, it's ahead. stuff we've already kind of covered so but yeah it says um to heal the gender war rooted in struggles for power women and men choose to make mutuality the basis of their bond ensuring that each person's growth matters and is in and, and is nurtured so I really think that okay so just to give everyone the room context as to why I'm speaking and why I'm reading that quote I actually dived into reading Bell Hooks based on a Twitter room in which a guy who has holds a PhD was espousing um, some pretty uh, negative and you know concerning thoughts in regards to Bell Hooks that made me scratch my head. And since I was not familiar with her work, I wanted to read it for myself. I did reach out to Chu. She suggested this book. I started reading this book, but then I saw that she had another book that was kind of like a hand it's like a handbook uh, for feminism it's like uh, feminism is for everyone um the language is pretty accessible it's a pretty quick read but after reading that book i was pretty much pissed off because that guy who holds credentials was essentially lying to an entire room full of black men and filling their their heads with this notion that black women black feminist women hate men and which is literally antithetical to the thesis quote unquote of feminism, especially when it comes from black women. So um, that's contextually what 
inspired me to do to read this information. And that's why I wanted to share that quote, because to me, it seems like it's just based in a land of egalitarianism, where everyone is like, everyone is equal, and we should be teaching and respecting everyone as individuals, regardless of if they're a male, female, a child, etc. That's what I got from her work. Um, and I think that that is the message that needs to go out to people because we clearly have been lied to. With that, I will yield and I will drop down the listeners. But thank you so much for holding space uh, to do these readings and to educate people on what this really is and not the propaganda that we see in media. No, I appreciate you coming and contributing. Like, I hope you come back because discussing and talking with y'all, this is dope. Choose again, you were right. Discussion is important and I'm feeling it. Also too, about engaging in her work. If you listen to the previous recordings and damn, I wish me and Choose had read it together in a space because when me and Choose started reading it together, we had heavy criticisms. We was like, uh, I don't remember it's feeling like this the first time, but that's how you engage with literature and anybody's work critically. But again, based in fact, and that's not what they're doing over there in the quote unquote black male studies section in Torrain Walker's weird ass. Like that shit is literal fascist propaganda. And again, since people reading Finding leisure time to read is a privilege, but then also to like being able to comprehend what you're reading and engage in it critically takes practice. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do reading spaces is when I stop and do commentary, I understand to put it in layman terms and connect it to people's material conditions helps us understand what we're reading. So I, I, I do want to go through all of Bell Hooks works in this way publicly and so people can access it. So just real quick before I go to a pimp. Um, that if you go back to the beginning of the space, this recorded space, I went to chapter eight and there will be other chapters and I will cover the entirety of this book as well as Bell Hook's other works. So y'all can go back and listen to and how we got here in this discussion. Go ahead, a pimp. Yo, what up? Hope everybody's, you know, doing good and all that. Uh, I ain't about to hold you, first of all. I haven't read, and I don't know if I'll have time to read these books. Uh, a lot of shit I'm reading and writing about already, and I'm not really about adding more to my already full plate. But um, I also want to preface by saying also that um, my wife is white and my daughter is mixed, um, and that wasn't that isn't because of my need. Or proximity. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> I don't want to hear that shit. <laughs> so I removed him from speakers. Is like I don't want to hear no campaign on why you picked a snow roach. Like that's not what we're talking about here. I didn't want someone to like defend their position on why they picked, you know, a fucking alabaster demon. That's not what this is for. Like so, I removed him. But anyways, if anyone else no, has anything to say, <laughs> no, I don't want to hear that. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm fucking over here screaming right now because what? We're over here building and they're like, you know who I need to defend at this moment as we're talking about the exploitation and Black people finding, you know, trying to connect and build community. I need to defend Becky. No, we're not going to center her in a Black-ass conversation. What is, what is You thought who? The blue dot would do what? Not, no way. Go over there and find that elsewhere. We're good over here. So yeah. Um, if anybody else would like to speak on some black ass shit <laughs> no I can't screaming yo hold on no but for real like that's weird to me like we're talking about the harms in which us not being able to engage people out there disseminating false propaganda of lies so that we don't study the works of people who looked at our conditions and how that's affecting us as black people from building and also the re counter-revolutionary effects those things have and homeboy was like i need becky to be the center of this fuck what y'all talking about no that's not you're missing the point and i don't have time to explain it to you so yeah anybody who is not engaged to work you can go back and listen to the recordings and it's there even if you haven't engaged to work and want to engage in a conversation i just ask that you keep it on what we're talking about I'm not centering whiteness in any space. So just a full disclosure. If you see a blue dot opening up a space, whiteness is not the center. They're the center of the fucking world through violence and omnicidal genocide. 
in a space that I create, you're going to be safe to know that your Blackness, your humanness is centered here always, first and foremost. So if anyone else has anything to contribute, don't hesitate to grab a mic. But if that's it, I'll end the space. Yeah, that was good. Um, I'm screaming because that shit was funny as hell. Um, I just am glad that, you know, we're having these conversations about the misinformation that's happening on this app because it's really crazy to watch. Um, And it's really crazy to experience people who are like literally... Um, I really like he left, but he was talking about it's about control. And Mm -hmm. when I think about what's happening on this app, especially in terms of violence towards women, it's always about control. And that's why all the niggas were defending that person who was attacked. um, Well, I guess defaming the woman who was attacked with a brick. And they were talking about it like there was um, there's always a way that violence is about control and they want women to feel at risk. They want women to feel unsafe and they want to feel, this is why I'm really resistant to this conversation about protection. I don't feel like we should be saying or espousing that Black men should be protecting us because I don't feel like it's about protection because to them, protection is about ownership and it's about like a, a transaction. And it's not about that at all. It's about solidarity. If you are a man, you should be in solidarity with women and not feeling like you need to protect them because you also need to protect them from yourself because a lot of these niggas is like also doing this black male study stuff because they are really like bypassing the own work that they need to go through like on an interpersonal level and an individual level like they need to just go to therapy for real for real and then stop hating women on the internet but um this was good no that's a good point you know the control aspect uh i think his name was godfather he he brought that up and yeah with the woman with the brick the reason why that is such a counter-revolutionary way to approach any kind of communal uh relationship with anyone in your community is because then you create a dynamic in which who is worthy of being respected when you look at people as objects it's like well okay what which one has value and do they have value enough to be protected and should i protect them because what happened was with that uh rhoda is the sister's name who got hit with the brick by that fucking... Anyway, fuck that nigga for real. But people were looking through her background to see if she was worthy of being protected. Like, that's crazy to me, but that's part of the control. Like, the control deal is is that I can't protect everyone because then it would be egalitarian. Everyone would be equal. So I have to create a group that's worthy of protection. Therefore, I also have to create a group that's worthy of being marginalized. And not just in marginalized as ignored, but marginalized and now, uh, and now allowed to be acted upon violently, to take all our toxicity on, that we can extract that upon that group that we choose to exercise from the community, right? That is the problem. That's another aspect of it, too, that we saw publicly on this timeline where people literally created whole ass dissertations on why she was unworthy of protection and also worthy of violence. And not only did they all form together like Voltron to make up this narrative, they were willing to attach themselves to any lie and false narrative there was with no further investigation. But with her and her story, they didn't take that as face value. They didn't take that as a call to action to examine themselves and check the brothers in their community who engage in massage and war. No, they took that as a, as a time to now become cops and feds and start investigating shit, but not investigating for like credible sources, but for confirmation bias on why they should keep being violent towards black people in their community, especially dark skinned black women in their community. The shit was sick, sick, and, but a good way of taking a temperature check. If I was a colonizer looking at Twitter and wanted to see a temperature check on where the colonized minds are at, I'd be like, yo, we won. Like, I have, I have worked on this for oh so many centuries. I have the perfect slaves. Like, these people are the dreams of the slave masters because they were all literally falling over each other to, to loudly say, I am a coward. I will not align with my own people. I will not be in solidarity with members of my community. I choose the state. I choose fascism. I choose to capitulate to it. They literally did that. And I mean, it was so sick, but it's where we're at. But yeah, no, Chiz, you bring up a really good point. I'm glad Godfather brought up that part, that aspect about control. He hit it like right on the nail. But if anyone else has anything to add or not add, I'll go ahead and end the space. There's going to be a space at three o'clock today 
on the book called The New Authoritarians, Convergence of the Right, basically talking about, he takes a real moderate uh, perspective. I have to say that. It don't go hard enough for me, but we could still, there is still information in there that we can use and also expand upon in discussion and commentary. So if we you want to read about fascism and the right and their strategy and the way they're approaching it, the book also has a game plan on how we can confront it. Again, it's not radical at all by any means, but a good way, a, a source of information for discussion. So that's going to be at three my time, which is central. So if in, anyone else have anything to add, any of the speakers want to say anything else? Y'all good? This was so good. <laughs> I love this space. Yo, it was. Thank Y'all. You. My bad. Y'all made it good. And I'm glad you can make it choose. All right, I'll go ahead and end the space. And I always end it with let's get free. <laughs>